All right, good evening, New Heights Church family, those here and those watching online. We appreciate you watching and listening this evening. Uh, we're going to go ahead and sing Are You Washed in the Blood? We're going to sing that song. It's, I love the song. It's a great upbeat song. Let's go ahead and start it. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansions bright? Are me washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? On the fourth. Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We're going to go ahead and sing, There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the prayer precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for our cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Third for the last. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. 285, for those using the hymn book, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. We've been focusing on the blood of Jesus. Now we'll focus on the cross of Jesus in this wonderful song. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I find a place to stand and wonder at such mercy that calls me as I am. For hands that should 
discard me. Old wounds which tell me come beneath the cross of Jesus, my unworthy soul is one. Beneath the cross of Jesus, his family is my own. One strength chasing selfish dreams, now worn through grace alone. How could I now dishonor the ones that you have loved beneath the cross of Jesus? See the children called by God. cross of Jesus, the path before the crown. We follow in his footsteps where promised hope is found. How great the joy before us to be his perfect bride. We will gladly live our lives. Amen. Alonzo, why don't you come lead us in prayer this evening? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us here together this evening. Um, I pray we would be thankful for our salvation. And so, thank you so much for dying on the cross for us. Pray that you will be, the, be with the message to come. Um, please give um, Gary the words to speak, Lord. We thank you so much for this church. We thank you so much for your blood that shed for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. When I survey the wondrous cross, this wonderful contemplative hymn guides us, our eyes to the cross and to look on it. Let's think about that as we sing that. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gave.
we stand for this last song, Near the Cross, I'll Watch and Wait. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the time to be able to have a service tonight for you, Lord. Be with those that are not here today, that some are dealing with sickness, and that be able to heal them throughout this week, that they're able to feel better pretty soon, and some that are traveling, that um, as they're traveling, that you'll keep them safe um, on their destination, on their way back home as well. Be with the mess about to have tonight, and the offering about to take up for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, I guess that means it's my turn. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Hebrews chapter 11, please. I only got through the first seven verses, so we got a little ways to go yet.
we're going to pick it up with verse 11 or verse 8 and take it down through the end of the chapter. Is this on? Okay. Just didn't sound like it up here, but now now it does. Now it does. Okay. So if you would uh, stand with me, please, and as we read, we'll read, uh, follow along with me as I read verses 8 through 11. At this point in time, we're not going to read the whole rest of the chapter, but we'll get to those verses as we go. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you now tonight, we're thankful for those who've been able to make it out to the service tonight, thankful for all who have attended, and we just pray that You will bless them and encourage them through the preaching of your word tonight. We think of those online as they watching there. We just pray that you'll bless them. Uh, Because of illness possibly not here, we just pray that you'll heal their bodies, strengthen them, and bring them back as soon as possible to be with us. Now, Father, we pray that you'll take this time tonight. May you guide and direct my heart, the thoughts in my mind, and in my heart, and just pray that you will uh, guide and direct in what's said and done. Father, may all of it honor and glorify thee, we pray in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Many have tried to explain faith over the years. Some have tried with long, difficult words, but it usually comes down far short of clearly making it. A Sunday school teacher asked her class one day that same question, what is faith? One girl responded by saying, faith is doing God's will and asking no questions. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Faith is doing God's will and asking no questions. Of course, In that underlies the idea of belief and trust in the Lord, that what he's saying is the right thing. As the author of Hebrews tells us, faith is having the confidence and conviction based on the revelations of God that what he has said will come to pass. Defining or describing faith is a good thing, but even more Importantly, there's a need to apply faith to one's life. As we saw in the first portion of the passage this morning, that's what we want to see tonight. As the author of Hebrews applies faith and shows how it worked and how it was witnessed in the lives of all these people in the Old Testament, for the most part. The story is told of a poor widow woman who sat in her room weeping over the body of her dead husband. Just then, their only son came into the room and asked, Why do you weep so, mother? The mother then explained their loss and stressed the fact of their deep poverty. The little boy thought for a moment and then simply said, Is God dead too, mother? This little boy realized that, yes, dad was gone, dad provided, but even more so, God provides. And he believes that God would be there. The author of Hebrews applies faith to many aspects of life because it is right where it is needed. We have seen him apply it to the world in verse 3, 
We've seen him apply it to worship in verse 4, to the witness of Enoch, and to our work by that of Noah. Now we want to continue on and begin by looking at briefly once again the life of Abraham, the lives of Abraham and Sarah. Verse 8 applies faith to one's walk. We see here the faith that Abraham had in his walk. Of course, Genesis 12 gives us a more detailed account of the life of Abraham and the story that it goes to, and we're not going to go through all of that. And in all of these cases, the author of Hebrews doesn't cover the entire lifespan of each of these individuals. He focuses on specific things that take place and how it applies to faith. So we have the story in Genesis 12 that gives us this more detailed account. He was called by God to leave his homeland, his family, his friends, and follow God to a destination that God would later reveal to him. He wasn't going to know where it was exactly to begin with, but he called him to go. And Abraham left and followed God, not knowing, as it says there, uh, when he was called to go into the place, uh, he went not knowing whether he, whither he went. And so it was a walk, a walk of faith. He trusted God and believed in God's revelation to him. It wasn't complete at that point in time, but I don't think any one of us has ever seen the complete revelation of God, either in Scripture or in our lives. How many of you would like to know exactly what God is going to do in your life for the next 10 years? I don't think any of us would really like to know that in advance. Some may say they do, but when it comes down to it, I'm not so sure I'd want to know now what's going to happen 10 years from now. I just don't, don't think that would be a good idea. How about if I take it one day at a time? And trust God to take care of that day. And if he chooses to show me tomorrow what he wants done today, I'm fine with that. If that's what he chooses. But we'll just take it as it comes. And that's what Abraham did. He walked by faith. As it says there in verse 8, it says that he was in a place and he obeyed. And it was the place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. The story is told of a circuit riding preacher years ago who was traveling on horseback to the next place where he was going to preach. And he came to this place where there was a crossroads that was in a low lying area. And it had rained previously, just a sh uh, short time before. And all four directions of that crossroad were covered in water. He couldn't see the road underneath the water. He stood there, or sat there on his horse for a little bit, thinking about what to do. And a stranger came by who knew the land. He said, go on, sir. You're quite good for it. Well, do you trust this man? And that's what he did. He decided to go on and follow in, and he went so far until the water was touching the saddle on the horse. God, do I go any farther? Is it going to get any deeper? And the man had stayed and was watching, and he said, Go on, sir, all is right. To that, the preacher replied and decided to go on, and sure enough, he made it. He couldn't see the steps ahead. He couldn't see where to go because of the water that was over the road. But here was this man who knew the crossroads, who knew the pathway, and he said, you're fine, you can make it, go on through. Is that the kind of faith that you have in a walk of trusting the Lord, going, maybe not knowing what the path is going to be, what the steps are to take, you are to take, but... You follow that path. Then in verses 9 and 10, 
we find the author applying faith to something that we all dislike. Waiting. How many of you like to wait in line? Stand in line and wait. And wait. And wait. And wait. The story there is told here, as it says, verse 9, Abraham, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Here he was, by faith, he was traveling in the area, in the property, as it were, that was going to be his. But it wasn't his yet. And it says, like a stranger. Have you ever felt that way? Like a stranger in something that you owned, and yet it didn't feel like you owned it? Here is Abraham traveling in the land that God has promised to him. I'm going to live in tents. My sons are going to be there with me, and we're going to live in tents. For how long is this going to go on, Dad? How long are we going to live in tents and not put our roots down and build a house and stay there? And Abraham had to say, I don't know. It's up to God. He's the one that makes the decisions. And when he lets me know what he wants done, I'll do it. In the meantime, we wait. Verse 10 tells us, notice what it says, He looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. He was looking while he was waiting. He was trying to see what God had in store, but he didn't know what the next step was. He just had to wait. And that's what God did in the life of Abraham in this case. It was a waiting faith. What would happen if God asked you to wait? Wait for a time. Is it fun? Joe's been having to wait, right? He's getting married in a how many days? 32. I figured you'd have days and hours and seconds. Figure it out, but here he's been waiting. It's, he knows when the time's coming. It's just over the horizon. It's not far away, but it's been a wait. Knowing that it's God's will, knowing that that's the next direction to take, but the promise is there and the conviction to believe that that's God's will and God's direction, but he's willing to wait. It's interesting to notice then in verses 11 and 12, talking about Sarah, uh, the first woman that's mentioned here in the passage, in this lineage of faith believers. And notice the words. It says, through faith, verse 11, also Sarah herself. The author puts some emphasis here. He could just say, through faith also Sarah received strength to conceive seed. But he didn't say it that way. He added another word in there, a personal pronoun, to draw some emphasis. Sarah had a mind, had a will, had an ability. She was one of God's chosen children. God didn't pass women off back then. Men did. But God didn't. Men would look at women as property, as other things, as slaves, uh, not hold them in high regard, not treasure them. And here God says, Sarah herself was willing. Remember the story, of course. God came to Abraham and and told him, you're going to have a child. Remember we talked about the fact that Enoch had a child at age 65, 
This is even worse. When did Sarah have her child? How old was she? Anybody know? I believe it was 90. 90 years old, having a child. And of course, what was the response? <laughs> Laughter. They laughed at it initially. That's not mentioned here because it's not focusing on the faith aspect, the author of Hebrews. But he's not trying to put it down because ultimately at the end of this conversation that God shared with them and told them you'd have the son, her response was, yes, I'm willing. I'm willing to go through what you want. Notice how it's worded. Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She was willing to go through it and deliver a child at that age because she believed God. She judged him to be faithful in his promise. This idea of promise, asserting something. God was asserting, you will have a child. It's your heir. And Sarah judged. It's the same word used in verse 26 when Moses says, esteeming. That word esteeming is the same Greek word that's used, translated here, judged. In other words, they contemplated it, they came to the conclusion, the decision, this is what's right. And in this case, Sarah realized, yes, I'm willing to be a part of the future, a seemingly impossible event that's supposed to take place, but I, I judge God to be the one who's going to carry out His promises. He's going to be faithful, so I am willing to participate in this future event the birth of the child. Now, is God going to call some... Well, there's not too many here, right, that can have children, so God's not going to call us to have children. But if God is calling you to something, are you willing to carry it through? Do you have the faith to believe that his promises will come true. Sarah was willing to be involved. Even Sarah herself, God looked to her in making part of this decision. Not just Abraham, but Sarah herself came by faith, believing and trusting God to carry out the ultimate situation. Now then notice in verses, thir beginning with verse 13, down through verse 16, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And notice here what it says, They were persuaded of them and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Here they were willing to welcome what God wanted. By faith, willing to welcome. They, as it says, they, they were looking way down the road. They couldn't get a hold of it. They couldn't fully understand it. They couldn't grasp it completely. But they, it says there that they were persuaded. They were convinced. It's the same Greek word that's used in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 20 where the crowd gathered before Pilate and he said, I have two people here for you to pick from to who I am to release. Do you want to release Jesus or do you want to release Barabbas? And it tells us in verse 20 that the Jewish leaders persuaded, convinced the multitude to pick Barabbas. They convinced everybody that that was in their best interest 
was to release Barabbas instead of Jesus Christ. And that's the same word that's used here. They were fully convinced, they were persuaded by God that he was going to hold to his promises, that he was going to carry out the truth of what he said he would do. And so they were convinced. And then it says they embraced. Literally, that's as we think of an embrace. They folded their arms and brought it in and held on to it. The promise from God. They embraced it. They cling to it. And then it says, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That word confess is a compound word. Two words, homo and lagos. We've probably heard the word lagos. Of course, homo you've heard too. Homogenized milk. In other words, it's all the same. It's all mixed together. Lagos meaning word, and so we have here, they confessed or the same word. In other words, it's the same Greek word used in 1 John 1, 9, and where it says we confess our sins. It means here, as it does in 1 John, that we say the same words about a particular subject. Here, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins. In other words, if we say the same thing about what we've done as God says, He calls it sin, and so we say the same words. Father, I know you call it sin. I'm admitting it's sin. If we confess, if we speak the same thing, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here, they're saying the same thing. We're strangers. We're pilgrims on this earth. We look ahead and we see those promises. We cannot get to them. We don't fully understand them, but we are persuaded. We are totally convinced that what God says is true, and we embrace them, and we say it, and we know that it's true. And that's exactly what we say, the same thing God says. We're sojourners. We're pilgrims here. We're looking for a better place to go to. One day, that promise is out there. We, we're convinced that God's true about that, and one day we'll see that promise fulfilled. And so they welcomed into their life as these promises came across their path, as God reminded them time and again as things took place in their life. He reminded them, you've got property that's going to be yours here on the earth, but also in heaven. You are a child of God. And they were convinced and held to that. And they welcomed it. They realized they were reassured of a more permanent place with the King of Kings. Do you have that kind of faith? As you read the promises of God's Word, are you convinced of the truth of that promise? Do you embrace that promise and hold to it and say the same thing and say, God, here's a promise. You've given to me in your word. I believe it. By faith, I trust that it, the outcome is going to be true and honest. It's going to be what you've decided it to be, and I'm holding to that. I say the same thing that you say about that promise. Well, there's more throughout the chapter, and we want to go through a couple of them fairly quickly to get to, ultimately, uh, the end is what I want to deal with more so. So, verses 17 through 19, it talks about, uh, notice what it says there, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that if Isaac shall thy seed be called. He believed that God's promise that his heritage was going to come through Isaac. And so he held to that promise. And ultimately then, 
Verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. If God chose to allow him to be sacrificed, God could still bring him back to life and still use him to be the father of his offspring, of the nation that was to come. Abraham believed that. If you go back to the accounting of it there in Genesis, Isaac went with him to do the sacrifice. And as they were going, Isaac said, we have the wood, we have the fire, we have the knife, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham, by faith, said, God himself will provide the lamb. He's right up to the last moment. He believed it, and God did fulfill that promise. He provided the sacrifice, caught in the thicket. Then in verses 20 to 22, he mentions the wishes of Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. They believed that God was going to provide, and God carried out their wishes, their desires. Psalm 37, verse 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall bring it to pass. Delight thyself in the Lord, and that's what they did. They trusted him, and he brought the promises to pass. In verse 23, we find the beginning of a passage dealing with Moses, and it's applied to the watch care of this infant, put out in the bulrushes, as the story is told, to be protected, floating in a river, a baby in a basket, that's protection. God protected him. God took care of him. And from there on, even the nation of Israel, as they followed Moses into the wilderness and across the, uh, the Red Sea and into the, into the wilderness on the other side, God protected them all along the way. He told Moses, you're here leading the people. You're going to make it back to where you were in the deserts in Midian. You'll make it. You'll get back here where your father-in-law is. And sure enough, he did. The promises were true. They were fulfilled. God was faithful to his promises to Moses. Moses didn't have it easy, though. As it begins in verse 24 through 27, it tells of his life there in Egypt. And notice what it tells us there in verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He withstood the assaults, the popularity of the world in the day in which he lived, in verse 24. He refused it. The popularity that could be his, he refused it. In verse 25, he withstood the persecution from the world, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He didn't want to be popular in the world, and because of that, the world persecuted him. And he withstood that persecution. But notice in verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. There he withstood the pleasures of the world that were sinful. There were things that were there in Egypt that were sinful from the world, and he withstood those pleasures, recognizing that God was faithful, that what God would promise and provide was far greater than what this world could offer him. And that's why it says he had respect. He honored God and knew that what God said was true. And by faith he believed it, and it came to pass. 
He had the conviction that what God said was true. Even though Moses could not see the end, he believed in it. That's because he was focused. He was focused on the promises of God. Verse, verses beginning with verse 28 down through verse 30, we have Israel uh, being uh, talked about a little bit. Of course, with Moses, it says, through faith he, Moses, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying to do, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Here we have Israel being delivered from destruction in verse 28, from drowning in verse 29, and from defeat in verse 30. They gained victory at the walls of Jericho. Can you imagine military strategy today? Go march around the city seven times. Now total was what, 13 trips around uh, once each day for six and then seven times on the seventh day march around and the walls will tumble down. God's promise. And guess what? They believed Him. They didn't say, wait, God, let, uh, let's get the howitzers. Let's get the tanks. Let's get nuclear bomb. we got to use something because the wall of Jericho was thick. I forget how thick it was, but it was, it was thick. I mean, Rahab, as we'll see in a moment talking about Rahab, she lived in a house on top of the wall. So the wall was thick, thick enough to handle a foundation for a home. And they trusted God. They believed in His revelation to them that they were to do this, and they obeyed and followed what He said, and there was victory. Oh, we mentioned Rahab. She's mentioned in verse 31, the second woman to be mentioned in the passage. And it says, By faith the harlot Rahab perished, not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. Here was a harlot, and by faith, because of her faith in their God, Jehovah, wholesomeness came about in her life. She was changed. She was cleansed. She was taken care of. Her life was different after that because she believed God. She lived an immoral, ungodly life until faith was applied in her daily life. Now this woman is wholesome, godly, redeemed from sin and destruction. What a difference it can make when faith is applied to your life. It changed her completely. And I would believe by faith it's changed each one of us as we've trusted in what God said for salvation through Jesus Christ. And so up through verse 31, he talks about all these people. And then, more or less, the author realizes he's running out of time. So he kind of general, generalizes some things about faith and about some people. And he, as I look at it, I see three generalizations that are made. By faith, in verses 32 through 35, we have actions that are performed. Notice what it says in verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel of the prophets. Notice the actions. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, 
obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. Actions performed. The names aren't important. The places aren't specific. The decade or century is not even critical. It shows to us that faith in God's word is a word of action anytime. As someone said, it's not faith and works, and it's not faith or works, it's faith that works. And so actions that took place. But notice it changes in the middle of verse 35 down through verse 38. Notice what it says. And others. No names are mentioned here back in the actions that took place where victories were won, in verse 32, we had names. Just briefly, but names. But here it says, and others. Those others went through some tremendous things. Remember, by faith, atrocities are endured in these verses. It's not happily ever after. By faith, we believed, and so everything's great and fine and wonderful, and we lived happily ever after. No, that's not always the case when we live by faith. What does it say there in verse 35? And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. They didn't give up. They were faithful to God. They may not live. And in most cases, they didn't. But they chose not to turn away from Jehovah. Verse 36, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, Moreover, of bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. That's not happily ever after, folks. But it is still trusting God. By faith, they believed His promises to be true, and as a result, they held to God, and as a result, they went through terrific trials, hardships, difficulties, pain, and death as a result of being faithful to God. All times of faith are not times of jubilation. All times of faith don't end with that phrase, happily ever after. The focus cannot be just on the happiness gained or the hardship endured. The focus must be on the person in which we base our faith. God, who cannot lie, who doesn't turn away from His own. Oh, but He let them die! Think about what took place when they died. Where did they go? Who is it? I don't know who came up with a statement, but uh, you can't threaten me with death because if I die, I'm going to heaven. How greater bliss and joy than we can have than do that. You can't threaten me with death. Because of the person who holds it. As the song says, I don't know about tomorrow, but I know who holds my hand. That person 
faith in Jesus Christ. And so the atrocities that are endured. But then in verses 39 and 40, as he finishes the chapter, there's accomplishments that are completed. He brings all of these specifics in verses 1 or 3 through 31, actually, and the generalizations together, and he applies them to the current situation, the believers that he's speaking to that the book is written. He focuses in on the accomplishments that are completed. All the believers acted in faith without ever having received the final fulfillment in this life. They were looking forward to the cross. No, they didn't see a cross because it wasn't clearly stated in the prophecies of the Old Testament. There was stated suffering and pain and a sacrifice. And of course, Christ was going to go through all that, shed his blood. But they were looking forward to these promises, not understanding it, not being able to grasp it completely, but trusting God that they were going to take place. And they didn't take place within their lifetime. Notice what it says in verse 39, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should be made perfect. The believers at the time of the writing were living in a time of fulfillment by Jesus Christ. As this author of the book of Hebrews, he says the Old Testament was looking forward, but now these people, they were looking back. Christ had been crucified by this point in time. They now could know the fulfillment of what the Old Testament saints were holding on to. And now this group could carry it on forward. Faith in the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Faith and trust in the promises. God was faithful. God is still faithful. And Paul, Paul I say Paul, some believe that he wrote the book of Hebrews, so I guess the bag is out, but that's what I said here. But we need to see ourselves in this. Faith. Application. The doctrine is true. By faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's faith. Faith. But do we have it? Have we applied it? Are we holding to the promises of God and trusting Him that He will fulfill those truths? The challenge is given to endure like those who have gone on as they look forward not to Christ's coming, but to Christ's coming again now. And the application is there. <clears throat> Imagine with me a giant steam engine locomotive pulling into the train station, you know, belching out the smoke and the steam and pulling into a halt, dropping off some people, picking up some more. They're ready to depart again. And the steam engine is ready to go. They're building up the steam. They're ready to start forward. Something's wrong. No longer are the cars coming with the steam engine. The box cars are staying. Why? They've got to stop and find out what's going on and what takes place. Two um, claw-like catches one on the back of each uh, uh, car is there. And they come together to form a tight bond. And that's how the cars follow along with the steam engine. The steam engine, as it pulls out, these cars are hooked together by that, those clasps. They're put back in place. They're hooked up. 
the steam engine can go on again, pulling every car with it that should be. The all-important ingredient has been discovered. The couplings that connect each car together and to the engine were undone. They're reclasped and they can move forward. Those clasps are like faith in our lives. Christ being the conductor, being the head of that steam engine as he pulls and goes, as we are hooked with him and believe and trust in him, we're moved. We're pulled along. We head to the final destination. But if we're not trusting, if we're not looking to him, if we're not holding on to the truth of his word, we're left behind. Faith must be applied. It doesn't matter whether it's in our walk or our work, our watch care, our witness, our worship. The engine under the guidance of the conductor moves the train towards its destination and there's win. There it's a win for all because they're connected to the conductor. Christ. Personal faith. Individual faith. But in some cases in these verses we see groups were involved. And the same is true today. Each of us must have an individual faith and trust and reliance. But as a body of believers here, as a church... We need to have faith. We need to be connected to the truths of God's word, recognized as a body moving forward with him. If you've had an opportunity to look at the papers that were handed out about the budget this morning, you can see on that that there's some increase. Some which is out of our control. That's the rent. That's to be raised. Exactly what that's going to be, we still don't know. We're trusting in the Lord to maybe keep it down, but we don't know what's going to happen. But we've also put within there as a board a salary for a pastor. Our desire is by faith as a body that we no longer sit still but move forward. We need our pastor. Just as we need the Lord, He has a messenger that's here to guide us and help us and lead us along the way as a body. And we need more of his attention and time in the church instead of having to raise income for his family. I hope as you look at the budget that you will realize it's going to cost something. And by faith, each one of us, whether we're here in this room or online, by faith it's going to take some sacrifice, some discipline, some effort. By faith, as we ask the Lord to bless us and encourage us and help us and help us grow, either numerically or financially, and both actually is what we want, By faith, stepping out, holding to the promises of God. They are true. They are faithful. We can keep them and see them applied and acted upon and see them completed.
And so as the author finishes the chapter 11 of Hebrews, he goes into chapter 12. No, I'm not going to preach a message through chapter 12 now, but we're going to read the first two verses because they start with the word wherefore. It's connected to Hebrews chapter 11. And so let's see what he wants done. Notice what it says. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. All of these people endured and went through tremendous things by faith believing in God. And the author says, you're in a race too, folks. There to these Hebrew believers, it can be applied to us today. We're in a race. Run the race. Lay aside the weight. Lay aside the stuff that's slowing us down and let us look to Jesus and hold to Him for the outcome. Be faithful. Endure. He endured the cross for you and me. I don't know if we will ever go through suffering like some of these people did for the cause of Christ, but it's looking more and more like it in the United States that we will suffer punishment, persecution, pain, imprisonment possibly, as some already have for the cause of Christ here in this country. Run the race. Be faithful to a faithful God. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity tonight to look into your word, to bring your word before believers tonight. Pray that you might help each and every one of us to be encouraged and challenged by the lives of these individuals throughout chapter 11 of Hebrews. Help us to see some of what they went through and be encouraged that as fellow human beings, we can endure if we trust you and follow you. You can give us the power and the strength, the wisdom, what's needed for us to go on. And Father, I pray that as a body of believers here, this local church, this group, help us to do that very same thing, to step out by faith, believing and trusting in you and following your direction as we seek to serve you here. Be with us as we close the service now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing 472, My Jesus, I Love Thee, as our invitational song. And uh, if you have something that you have to commit to the Lord, something that uh, needs more faith in your life, now would be the time to focus on that and to commit that to him. My, My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine, for Thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Savior. To close out our service, we're going to sing 254, Every Day with Jesus is Sweeter Than the Day Before.
Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus, is sweeter than the day before. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you Wednesday, Lord willing, at 6.30. Stay safe out there. Have a good night, everyone.